Welcome to NOAA Live. My name is Nicole Bartlett, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is sponsored by NOAA's Regional Collaboration Network, where I work, which is spread across the country and helps connect people to all that NOAA does. It's also sponsored by Woods Hole Sea Grant, located at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution here on Cape Cod, Massachusetts. NOAA Live webinars will be offered most Wednesdays during the school year at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. To get more information, simply visit the Woods Hole Sea Grant Education webpage or follow us on Facebook. This series is designed to help you get to know NOAA and some of our incredible experts. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Today, we're introducing you to Derek Manzello with NOAA's Atlantic Oceanographic and Meteorological Laboratory in Miami, Florida. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in understanding coral reefs, we want to recognize that we are all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. We acknowledge that Derek is coming to us from the land of the Seminole people, and we're hosting this webinar from the ancestral lands of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe and the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead Aquina. A few guidelines before I hand you over to our speaker. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we wanna make sure everyone can hear Derek. However, there is a box where you can write questions. Please let us know if you're a class tuning in and if there are multiple people watching with you, let us know who's asking the questions so we can acknowledge them. We encourage you to ask them as we go and I'll be keeping track for Derek. We'll stop every now and then and answer a few. We may not get to all your questions, but we're gonna to try to answer as many as we can. All right, uh, we are ready to go. And Derek, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Awesome. All right, well, let me just get my windows all set up here. All right, well, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you all today. I'm very excited about this because it allows me to talk about what I love most, and that is coral reef ecosystems. Um, so my name, the slides going here. My name is Derek Manzello. I was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. Uh, this is a picture of me probably when I was about six years old, I think. Um, but Chicago is landlocked. It's a thousand miles from any ocean. Uh, however, when I was a kid, I always loved the water. I loved the beach. I loved fishing. There was nothing I'd rather be doing than to be being around uh, water and any kind of activity around water. And from a very early age, uh, I was very fortunate because my parents always told me that there will be nothing more important in your life than your education. And I took that to heart and I focused on my schoolwork and I did well, I attended, I paid attention, I got good grades. And as a result, my life after school has been absolutely phenomenal. So my advice to you Pay attention in school, do well, because your future is going to be bright and you're going to be a leader of tomorrow if you listen to your parents and do well in school. So after high school, I went to the University of Miami down in Florida. And the reason I went to the University of Miami is because they have an excellent marine biology program. And the only reason I was able to go to the University of Miami was because I had excellent grades growing up and I took my education very seriously. So again, the world will be your oyster if you do well in school and you have plenty of opportunities once you get to college and beyond. So when I went to the University of Miami for college, I had never been outside of the United States before. But now, 20 years later, thanks to me doing well in school and getting an excellent job, I have been able to travel the world and see some of the world's most beautiful coral reefs. So these dots you see on this map are some of the places I'm gonna be talking to you about today that I have been fortunate enough to visit thanks to my amazing job. And I've been fortunate enough to see some of the most beautiful coral reef ecosystems on the planet. So what is a coral reef? Well, a coral reef <clears throat> is simply a complex structure built by corals and other calcifying organisms. So here are some pictures of coral reefs that I have taken during my travels. And I will note that all of these pictures in this presentation I took while doing field work as part of my job. I also love photography, 
So not only does my job allow me to be in the water seeing these amazing things, but I'm also able to take these pictures to be able to show people who might not be so lucky to see coral reefs in the, in the wild what we have uh, in our oceans. So here's some beautiful pictures from Papua New Guinea, from the Indian Ocean, from the Florida Keys, from the Pacific side of Panama, from Fiji, from Saipan. And one thing I want you to notice about all these pictures is that all of these reefs look different. And this is because coral reefs in different parts of the world look very different. And this is because of many factors, things like uh, continental drift, which I'm sure if you haven't learned about, you're gonna learn about later, things like ocean currents. Um, but I do have one question. This picture on the bottom right, I took this photograph in Saipan in 2013. Now Saipan is an island in the Pacific Ocean about a thousand miles south of Japan. Can somebody tell me what is different about this picture than the other pictures that I just showed? Okay, this is Nicole from the chat box. So what do you guys think in this picture on the right in Saipan? What looks different about those coral reefs? So Texas, who's from Colorado, says it's above the water. Um, and Joseph and Mrs. Mitchell and uh, yeah, everyone sees that it's sticking out. It's not underwater. You guys are very, very observant. Very, very good. So the oceans experience this thing called tides that's controlled by the position of the moon and the gravitational pull of the moon on the planet. Now, this causes the ocean levels to go up and down. In some parts of the world, the tides are very, very large and can be upwards of 10 to 20 feet. Now, in Saipan, several times a year during the most extreme tides, waters lower to the point where parts of the reef get exposed. Now, corals like being in water, so this does in fact stress them out, but luckily it's short enough in duration that they can survive these periodic short-term exposures to air. And the way they do that is they generate a lot of mucus. Basically, corals make a lot of snot, and that protects them from the air and the sun and all that kind of stuff that they're exposed to when they're out of the water. So this is a very interesting, cool phenomenon to see a coral reef in the air. Great job answering that question, guys. Do I need to, there we go. So why do we care about coral reefs? Well, there are many reasons we care about coral reefs. Not only are they just absolutely beautiful to look at, but they are biodiversity hotspots or sometimes they are called the rainforests of the sea. This means that many, many species live on coral reefs. Now, it's been estimated that about 25% of all the species, all the organisms in the ocean are occur on coral reefs. And this is despite the fact that coral reefs only make up about 0.1% of the sea floor. So you have these incredible concentrations of very diverse organisms living on coral reefs. Now, from a more practical standpoint, coral reefs provide excellent protection from storms. Now, living in Miami, every year we face the threat of hurricanes and tropical storms. Without the coral reefs in the Florida Keys and off the coast of Miami, the damage associated with those storms would be far greater than what we normally see. Also, things like fisheries, uh, clutching fish for food, are very important on coral reefs. And overall, it's been estimated that reefs are worth about trillions of dollars on a global scale, and they contribute about billions of dollars to the US economy. What that means is people go on vacation to places like Key Largo, Key West, and when they go, they spend money at hotels, they spend money on dive boats, they spend money to go out and see coral reefs, they spend money to go fishing on coral reefs. All of these things contribute to our economy and healthy coral reefs are key to a healthy economy in coastal locations. So how do scientists measure coral reef health? Well, one of the favorite things I like to do is scuba diving. If you wanna know how a coral reef is doing, you've gotta get in the water and you've gotta look at it and you've gotta take surveys and you gotta collect samples. So this is an image of one of my dive buddies, a guy by the name of Paul Jones in the flower garden banks in the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see a big school of jacks swimming over him as he's down there looking at the reef. 
This image on the left, this is one of the few pictures that was not taken by me in this talk because that is a picture of me taking the picture. That's a picture of me surveying a coral reef in Papua New Guinea. This picture on the right is my friend and colleague, Ian Enox, taking a coral sample from the Galapagos Islands. So scuba diving is a very important part to a lot of the research that goes into documenting coral reef health. This picture is a picture from Fiji. And if you look down, you can see a scuba diver down there taking measurements of corals down that reef slope. So as I said, we also take surveys when we're in the water. So what you see here are what are called landscape mosaic images. Now on the left is a coral reef from the Florida Keys and on the right is a coral reef from the Flower Garden Banks. So what, how we generate these images is that a diver uses a sophisticated camera rig and he swims over the reef in a lawnmower pattern. So it's essentially like if you're mowing your lawn, but you're doing it with a camera and you're swimming over a reef. And using some sophisticated software, we can generate these images that we then use to look at coral reef health over time. So these images, the one on the left is from 2014, and the one on the right is from 2015. And that the map in the lower left corner shows you where these images were taken. And for scale, to give you an idea of how big these pictures of the reef that you're looking down upon are, basically the, the borders of these plots are about the size of a school bus. So you're looking at a reef, if you lined up four school buses in a square, that was what you would be seeing uh, when you look down on this reef. So we also take samples when we study coral reefs. So these are two divers taking a coral core sample from the Flower Garden Banks in the Gulf of Mexico. So how this is done is the divers use a drill, essentially the same drill that you might use in your house to hang up a picture. But the drill is modified with a core bit on it and you take the drill and you drill a hole right down the center of the coral and you pull it out and you take the sample. Now, believe it or not, this doesn't harm the coral. And the reason it doesn't is because you're only taking a very, very small piece of the living tissue. And the rest of it is the inorganic skeleton that the coral lay down over time. So we collect the coral core. Here's a picture of a coral core. And we put it into a CT scanner. Now, the CT scanner, this is exactly the same CT scanner that if you go to the hospital and you break your leg or something like that, they're gonna put you into this tube and they're gonna take x-rays. We do the exact same thing with corals. And the reason we do that is because corals lay down annual bands much in the same way that tree rings lay down rings. So you can determine how old a coral is and how fast it's growing. So in these images here on the right, these are pictures of cores we've taken from these corals that we CT scanned. And if you look at these pictures, you'll see that there's these repeating bright white uh, bands or lines that go across the coral. So these are called density bands. And these are laid down every summer in these corals. So the distance between these bands represents a year of growth for these corals. So up here, we see in this coral species, this one grows slower, that's about 60 years of growth. We can go back in time and measure how fast that coral grew back to the year 1957. These corals down here grow a little faster. We can go back in time and measure how fast they've grown every year uh, back through 1970. So to give you an idea of how fast these corals grow, this coral on top grows about 0.2 inches every year. So to give you an idea, 0.2 inches every year, can you guys see this pencil? Yes. Or do I need to? Yes. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. So 0.2 inches every year is smaller than the width of this pencil. So every year this coral is only growing this much. They grow incredibly slow. And this is one of the reasons why corals, coral reefs are excep exceptionally sensitive to any damage or stress that occurs because it takes them so long to grow. 
So I, I guess at this point, does anybody have any questions they'd like to ask? Yeah, we do have some um, questions. This is Nicole from the chat box. Um, so picking right up off the topic you were just on there quickly, do corals grow just taller like we grow? Do they just grow up or do they grow out? That is a great question. Well, it depends on the coral. So the corals that I just showed you are what are referred to as massive corals. So massive corals grow into these like big domes. They kind of look like uh, like, a, like a ball, but like, you know, if you cut it in half. So it grows into this big, almost kind of spherical shape. So they're primarily growing up, but they're also growing out. Now there are branching corals that have very different growth strategies. Branching corals have branches and they will grow up and out. And the idea of a branching coral is it wants to create as much area of its body facing the sun because corals use the sun to generate energy. And then there's other corals that are called encrusting corals. So encrusting corals basically just grow on a surface, on a patch, kind of like uh, a good example would be um, if you, anybody knows what a, what a lichen is on a tree, that is what an encrusting coral grows like. It doesn't really grow up, it just kind of grows side to side. Gotcha. Okay, this is Nicole again. Liam really wants to know if you've ever been to Barbados, Derek. I have never been to Barbados, but I will say this, my freshman, during my freshman year in college, my roommate was from Barbados, a gentleman by the name of Ramon Roach. He was the smartest person I met during my entire college career. Um, and I believe he lives in Barbados again, um, but he is a marine biologist and I consider him a peer and I hope to get down there someday and check out your beautiful reefs. Great. Well, I hope that you get to too. Take me with you. Um, Jensen would like to know what is the best coral reef you've ever seen? That is a really hard question to answer because when I showed you those pictures in the beginning, it's like you can fall in love with any of those coral reefs. You know, it's really your preference. Um, but rather than the best coral reef I've ever seen, I would probably say there is a reef in the Philippines called Apo Island. And this is a very special place because the local community starting back, I think, in the early 1980s made a decision is they saw that people were coming from all over the world to dive where they live. And this community historically did a lot of fishing, took a lot of fish from the reef, collected corals, that kind of stuff to survive. But they were very wise and they learned that by protecting their reefs and not allowing fishing would bring more scuba divers and bring more money to their community. So this reef, Apple Island in the Philippines was absolutely phenomenal. I mean, corals like you've never seen, organisms like you've never seen. And the reef is so beautiful that the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago actually based their coral reef exhibit off of the reef at Apple Island in the Philippines. Um, but that being said, I have been lucky enough to see amazing reefs in places like Fiji, the Indian Ocean, Palau. Um, yeah, I mean, there are so many beautiful places to see out there. Um, but generally, that part of the world, like the Philippines, the Western Pacific, that is where I like to go the most. So I take any opportunity I can to get to that part of the world. That's great. Thanks. Um... And also just, um, there are a lot of questions that Derek may not cover that are general questions about coral. So if we don't get to your questions today, I wanted to remind you guys to go back and watch our webinar with Dana Wasunik Mendez from the Coral Reef Conservation Program, who gave a lot of detail about corals. Um, so that's on our YouTube channel and we'll make sure we cross link those on the website for you. Um, Michelle and Anna both want to know what are coral reefs made of? So coral reefs are fascinating because they are made up of coral, primarily coral skeletons. So when a, cor a coral grows, it lays down a calcium carbonate skeleton. It's very similar to the bones in our body. So our bones are made up of calcium phosphate. The corals use calcium carbonate and it's basically the same 
a chemical composition of something like marble, if you have a marble floor, it's calcium carbonate. So the coral tissue, the living tissue layer on a coral is very, very thin. It's like a tiny film over the skeleton. And as that skeleton lives and grows, it lays down, as that, excuse me, as that coral lives and grows, it lays down skeleton more and more. So as I showed you in that last one, that coral grows about 0.2 inches a year. So every year it's growing a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then over time, that coral material accumulates and that's what forms the reef. So it takes thousands of years for reefs to form, as you can imagine, because those corals are growing so slow and the reef itself is essentially the accumulation of coral skeletons over hundreds of thousands of years. Okay, I'm getting a lot of questions, so I'm just gonna ask a couple more so we can move on. Katya wants to know if corals change color. Yes, they do. So corals can change color naturally. Um, one of the things that's interesting is that in the winter time when it's colder and the water is more turbid and colder and there's more sediments, and sand blowing around, the corals will actually get darker. And the reason they do that is because they're actually building up their tissues. They're getting more fat in their tissues. They're getting uh, more, more of their symbiotic algae. So they get darker. And in the summer, they tend to get lighter because in the summer, temperatures get stressful and some of their algae start getting stressed out and aren't as healthy. And that can actually lead to the phenomenon of coral bleaching, which is what I will uh, discuss towards the end of the talk. So yeah, corals can change color naturally due to seasonal variation, and they can also change color as a result of coral bleaching when they turn white. But that is a stress response, and that is not good at all for the coral. Great. Um, we're going to move on, but I want I want to tell you guys a lot of your questions are coming up, so I don't want to steal Derek's thunder here. So um, I'm going to hold on to him if you don't get to him, Derek. Great. And if you have any questions that don't get answered, feel free to shoot me an email after this. I'll be happy to answer them. Um, so I mean, there's a lot, coral reefs are very complicated, very diverse. So there's a lot of questions you can answer. So I understand if you have questions that we can't get to. So another way that scientists measure coral reef health is by deploying scientific instruments. So this here is called a MAP CO2 buoy. And we deployed this in the Florida Keys in December of 2011. So it's almost been there for about 10 years. So this buoy measures the condition of the water around it. So it measures things like temperature, how much salt's in the water. It also measures carbon dioxide in the water and in the air. So what's cool about having buoys like this is that the data are sent via satellite back to the internet. So we can sit in our offices in Miami and see what's going on on our study reefs. So this just shows you a network. On the bottom right is a map of a network of these buoys in the Caribbean, um, and excuse me, at US reefs in the Atlantic. And the top shows you the kind of data that's generated so the carbon dioxide measurements in the atmosphere are in light blue and they're slowly going up every year. And then the carbon dioxide measurements in the water are in the dark blue. So you can see that there's quite a bit, a lot, quite a lot of variability in carbon dioxide and seawater. We also do field and laboratory experiments. So here you see some photos from an experiment that we initiated in 2017 and are actually still writing up the data on. So we wanted to understand why certain corals were more or less tolerant to high temperatures in the Florida Keys. So what we did was we took corals from reefs that were cooler and we moved them to reefs that were hotter to see if we could make them more tough and more able to withstand higher temperatures. Excuse me. So what we did is we collected corals, made them into the, all these little mushroom type looking things down here. And the reason they look like little mushrooms is because we built little stands for each one of these little coral fragments. And the reason we did that is because we didn't want the corals to get covered in sand. If you have a storm, you can get sand that gets washed over onto, onto uh, the reef like this. And also, when you put something out on the reef like this, you're going to have a lot of seaweed and algae that grows on top of it. So having these corals elevated like that keeps them away from algae overgrowing them and killing them. 
So after a year of these corals being in the field, we brought them back to the lab. And here you see these same corals in the lab and we expose them to high temperatures. And as you can see, the white corals here in the middle are ones that were very, very sensitive to high temperatures and they bleached. And we also found some corals were able to withstand high temperatures and survive. And this is important because we wanna identify which corals can survive warm waters so that we can use those to help restore coral reefs moving into the future. So believe it or not, there are coral reef scientists who monitor coral reefs via a computer and using satellites. So there are coral reef scientists that don't scuba dive. Instead, they actively monitor how hot the world's oceans are so that they can warn local partners in various parts of the world if their coral reefs are at risk for coral bleaching. So what you see here is a map from NOAA's Coral Reef Watch showing you how much heat stress re reefs across the world have accumulated as of G November 29, 2020. Now this is all just within the past 12 weeks. So areas that are red and purple mean that that location is experiencing a lot of warm water. And I wanna point out in particularly down here in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef sits right off the, the, the northeast side of Australia and you'll see a very big red patch right over the Great Barrier Reef. Unfortunately, the Great Barrier Reef has bleached, I think, three of the last four years. And in some places of the Great Barrier Reef, more than half the corals have died. And this is very, very alarming and scary. So now to lighten the mood a little bit, I wanted to talk to you about some of the, my favorite dive buddies that I've encountered. So one of the main reasons I do this job, as I said, is I love scuba diving. I love getting in the water because there's so many interesting things on coral reefs and in the oceans that will just blow your mind. Things you've never thought you would ever see outside of some science fiction alien movie. I mean, there are things in the water you will see that you just won't believe. So now I wanted to run through some of the favorite dive buddies that I encountered during my time doing this job. So this little guy, I was diving in the Gulf of Mexico at about 75 feet at the Flower Garden Banks. And I looked up and I saw a big eyeball looking at me. And I went, oh, hello. And it was this guy, a speckled hind. He's a type of grouper and he could turn his eyeballs and look straight ahead. And this is an adaptation that allows him to look for prey that he can then ambush and eat. So this is a cool little dive buddy that I found in the Gulf of Mexico. So as I said, my favorite place in the world to go diving is the Western Pacific. The Philippines is absolutely amazing. So there is a crab in this photograph. Can you guys see the crab in this picture? Can anybody spot that crab? Juan says he can see it. Okay, cool. So if you hadn't seen it, right here dead center, there's a little crab and he's super camouflaged. This is called a commensal soft coral crab. And he's totally camouflaged, and this protects him from being eaten by hungry fish and other predators who might wake up one morning and say, hey, I want crab for breakfast. So this guy has developed these adaptations over long periods of time so that he lives among this soft coral and you can't even see him. So the size of this little crab in this picture is smaller than the eraser on the top of your pencil. This grumpy looking guy is called a mantis shrimp. Now these guys are fascinating. I could talk to you for three hours just about mantis shrimp because these are some amazing, fascinating organisms. But one of the things they're most known for, here's another picture of the same guy, is they have incredibly powerful claws. So below his eyes here, you can see kind of these claw looking things that he has kind of tucked in. So when he wants to eat something that he sees, say a fish swims by and it looks yummy, he actually will punch it super fast and he punches it so fast that it can kill the fish or the other prey. Now these guys are able to punch so fast with their claws that they can break aquarium glass. So they pack one of the most powerful punches in the entire animal kingdom. And they're also incredibly beautiful. Wow, that's really cool, Derek. Can we back up for just two slides? 
to the sure. crab question because we someone wanted to ask what I think it was the one before with it. Wow, these pictures are beautiful. What kind of coral is is this crab on? So this is a soft coral. I actually forget the common name, but these are common in the uh, Western Pacific, okay. and they're absolutely beautiful. They come in dark purples and dark uh, reds, and the reason they're called soft corals is because they don't secrete that calcium carbonate hard skeleton. So a, a reef building coral that builds a reef, it builds that coral skeleton. So after the coral animal, if the coral animal dies, the coral skeleton remains. So this is a soft coral. It doesn't have any of that skeletal structure. So it doesn't really leave any kind of structure in place once it dies. So this is a, a soft coral. And there's some incredibly beautiful pictures of soft corals from places like Fiji, the Philippines. Um, I forget the common name of this species though, I'm sorry. That's all right. Uh this person was asking from Maine, so I have a feeling they're going to have to do some research anyway. Okay, you can keep moving, and as we get questions, I'll, if you want to just pause as, as after each buddy, we can relay okay. some questions. Cool. So the next guy that is incredibly cool that I spotted was an orangutan crab, and he's called an orangutan crab because he kind of looks like an orangutan. So he has developed all these very fine little red hairs all over his body and right here you can see his two red eyeballs sticking out and the reason he looks like this is because there's algae and seaweeds that look just like this so to a fish swimming across the reef looking for a meal he looks down he sees this guy he look, thinks it's just a piece of seaweed or algae that got stuck up on a coral so these guys are super cool and they've also developed this adaptation of camouflage to keep from being eaten on the coral reef So are there any questions about the crab, this guy? Right, any questions about the buddies we've seen so far? Um, <laughs> Joseph says, it looks weird. Um, and uh, yeah, everyone just says that they're very cool looking. So I, I think it's amazing, Derek, that you took these photographs. And so I think earlier in the presentation, you, there was a picture of you with your camera. So this is probably quite a different camera than the most of us are used to using, right? Yeah, so underwater photography, unfortunately, can be a little pricey, um, but we do need, you know, to, to, to work on coral reefs, we do really need good equipment. Um, so yeah, the cameras that we use definitely are a little more money than, you know, your Apple iPhone camera, I guess. Um, but yeah, it's, to be able to monitor coral reefs and see things, you know, and take these pictures require expensive instrumentation. So Sumner in Camden wants to know, how big is this crab? So this crab is probably about, I don't know if you can see me, but he's probably about yay big. He's small, he's not very big. He's probably about the size of like a cockroach. Cool, um, and Joseph said, why does he look like he has four eyes? <laughs> it's kind of interesting. Four eyes? Yeah. yeah. Um, I, does it, it, let's see, let's see. I think this, I'm not sure who was asking the question, but does this crab have a skeleton? It looks really soft and weak, they say. Yeah, so he is, he's just like any other crab. He has, you know, if you've gone to Red Lobster and seen crab legs or seen a real crab anywhere else, you know, they all have this, this, this carapace this, uh, it's, it's a skeleton. Um, it's not like the skeleton that corals build, it's more organic, uh, but yeah, he does have a skeleton. You just can't see it because he's all covered in all these little tufts of uh, hairs. Okay, I better let you move on because I remember what's next. Um, so go ahead to your next one. Cool. And then there's clownfish. I absolutely love taking pictures of clownfish. I could spend hours sitting there taking pictures of clownfish. So what we see here is a juvenile clownfish coming out, checking me out while his dad hides in the anemone, uh, safely tucked in. And he's, uh, you know, kind of probably telling his kid, get back here, what are you doing? Um, but yeah, clownfish are absolutely awesome to take photos of and they're just beautiful animals. So here's some more pictures of clownfish from Papua New Guinea. 
And then this one, you see the anemone has that it that it lives in has these beautiful purple tentacles. So I love taking pictures of clownfish. I can do this for days if given the opportunity. <laughs> They're beautiful. And then another thing I love to take pictures of are nudibranchs. So these guys are actually related to the slugs and the snails you may have in your yard or your garden, depending on where you live. But they look a heck of a lot different than the slugs eating your, eating your mom's plants. So these guys have spectacular, exceptional coloration. And the reason they have all this amazing coloration is because it's a warning. It tells anybody up there swimming around looking to eat them that if you eat me, you're going to regret it because you're probably going to die or get really sick. These colors tell the rest of the reef that I am extremely poisonous, so do not bother me. So this is why these guys look so amazing and so spectacular. And they come in, I mean, the colors that these guys come in are just mind blowing. And these are a few of my favorite pictures that I've taken over the years of nudibranchs. Wow, those are cool. So Alicia is asking, what is the coolest thing you've ever seen diving? And I have a feeling you're about to show them, right? Are we? Yeah, about you might. You <laughs> must. Uh, we're about two slides away. I'm going to show you a video of my favorite dive of my entire life. So stay tuned. Okay, so you wait for that, Alicia. Megan says the green one looks like a Pokemon. Uh, in this, I'm sure everybody. And then uh, Cola says they look like underwater worms. Um, they are very cool, and they're not hurting the corals. No, these guys, I think they primarily, this one on the bottom right, if you look at the, the one with the green and the neon orange, he's actually eating eggs of, I don't know what kind of eggs those are, but he's eating some kind of eggs. So they eat like different things. Some of them eat algae, you know, some of this one's eating eggs. So they really uh, don't do any harm to the coral. If anything, they're, you know, representative of a healthy coral ecosystem. They're beautiful. Okay, um, do these guys overpopulate if no one eats them? You know, I've never heard of that happening. Um, yeah, I've never heard of their populations really getting too crazy. So I, I'm not sure what, you know, what's controlling their populations if they're not being, you know, eat, eaten. Um, but yeah, I've never, never heard or seen anything about that happening. You can't get anything by our audience, Derek. So you better... Mind if anyone knows about a reef overpopulated by nudibranchs, let me know because I want to go there and take pictures. So I even, that's just a new word for new, me, nudibranchs. That's how you say it, nudibranchs. Yeah. Nudibranchs. So you guys try to use that word um, after the webinar. It's fun. All right, we can move on. I'm going to mute myself. All right, so now we're getting into the bigger stuff that moves around a little faster. So the next thing I'm going to talk about are sea lions. And this is another picture that I didn't take. This was taken by my dive buddy. And that's actually me taking a picture of a sea lion. And the reason I love this photo, other than the fact that it's beautiful, is that we have the same photo from a different, from my point of view. So this is what I was looking at when my dive buddy was taking that photo. So this wasn't planned, it just happened. But this shows you that sea lions are might be my favorite dive buddy. And the reason I say that is because sea lions are like puppies. They're like underwater puppies and they're big. They're like bigger than people sometimes. And they are fast underwater. They move underwater like a hummingbird moves on land. And they are so playful that they wanna see what you're doing and they wanna see what's going on. The first time I ever dove with a sea lion was in the Galapagos Islands. I was doing a coral survey, so I had a hammer to mark down a stake. Put the hammer down, looked away, looked back. All I saw was the butt of a sea lion and he was swimming away with my hammer in his mouth. So I had to chase him until he dropped the hammer and then I got my hammer and I can continue my work. Then another time, a friend and I, well, a colleague and I were diving 90 feet down in the Galapagos and I looked up and I saw his eyes were huge and I went, uh-oh, what's wrong? And then I looked up a little farther and there was a sea lion at 90 feet nibbling on his snorkel the way a dog would nibble on a chew toy. And he was not, he was a little scared, but luckily the sea lion let go and swam away. So these guys are just a riot underwater to dive with, to the point where they can interfere with your work by just messing with you. 
So here's another picture of me getting dive bombed by a sea lion. So this guy, the one thing this picture doesn't do justice is the fact that this guy swam at me probably 20 miles per hour straight at my face and then at the last second darted away. So sea lions are definitely among my favorite dive buddies. And then there's guys like this, sea turtles you see quite a bit. So this is a sea turtle that was lazily lounging on a wreck right off Waikiki Beach in Hawaii. And I just swam up, took a picture of him, and he didn't even bother to move. He was just happy, chilling out, taking a nap. And then there are tons and tons and tons and tons of fish, fish in different shapes and sizes that you can't even imagine. Now, I love fish, and this is one of the reasons I got into this career. So these are just some of the crazy fish encounters. So you see here's a, the same school of surgeon fish in the Galapagos Islands helping my buddy out look for a, uh, a temperature probe that he had deployed a few years earlier. And we see all kinds of crazy fish. So in the top right, you see uh, a whole school of Dory's family. In the bottom right, there was a snapper in the Indian Ocean who wasn't too happy about me taking a sample from his reef, kind of giving me that evil eye. Then that barracuda in the Gulf of Mexico, it looks like he's had some excellent dental work done. His teeth are quite white. And then we have the uh, top left, This is these are called batfish. And they're called batfish because they have those huge fins that make them look like a bat. And then in the bottom left, these guys are a lot of fun. These are called pipefish. They're tiny. They're almost like they're related to seahorses. And they kind of swim around and they have these faces that make them look like they have little attitudes. So they're super cute. And then the most famous fish of them all, sharks. Now sharks, we don't actually see very many sharks in places like Florida or the Caribbean Sea. Basically places where there's a lot of people, you're not gonna see a lot of sharks. That's because people have overfished sharks over the years. And one of the reasons they've been overfished is because there's a lot of fear about sharks. People don't understand sharks. They see the teeth and they get scared and they want to kill them essentially. But if you go to places where there aren't a lot of people, buckle up because you're going to see sharks and it's super cool. So this shark, what the one of the most famous places you can go to see sharks underwater is the Galapagos Islands. So this is a Galapagos shark that scared the living bejesus out of me. In 2017, I was diving and I looked up and my dive buddy pointed behind me and I turned around and the first thing I saw was that creepy eyeball looking right at me. This Galapagos shark had creeped up behind me and was checking me out. And that gave me quite a scare. But luckily he swam away and there was no harm done. Here's a black tip reef shark checking me out in French Polynesia. And my favorite sharks to dive with are the hammerhead sharks in the Galapagos. These guys are absolutely amazing. They are curious, they are huge, and they come in huge schools and they love to check people out. Now to give you scale, this is a full ground woman here, probably about five foot 10, in front of a very, very, very pregnant female hammerhead shark in the Galapagos. And now, hearkening back to that question, I'm gonna show you a video of the best dive of my life. This was in the Galapagos Islands in 2017. We had come to the end of our research trip. We had seen quite a few sharks, but our dive captain on one of the last days said, do you wanna see some tibarones? Tibarone is shark in Spanish. And we said, sure. And we jumped in and man, we saw some tibarones. This was crazy and intense, and I will never forget it. I don't think I've ever been more exhilarated in my entire life than I was on that dive. Sharks were all around, it's anywhere you looked. It was amazing. All right, so now I got a question for you guys before I go to the next part. So in my hand, I'm holding up two coral skeletons and are probably hard to see because it's gotten dark in here like Nicole feared it would. Um, so hopefully you can see these somewhat. So my question, can you see them? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So my question to you is what's wrong with these corals? Can you tell me what's wrong with these corals? 
Let's see, does anybody have any ideas what might be wrong with these corals? Jay says they're dead. Uh, others say that they're bleached. Liam says they're white. Uh, they look like cauliflowers, and they're white, so they're dead, says Christy. No color means they're dead. So you guys are all absolutely right. These are coral skeletons. When corals are healthy and they're alive, they are colorful. They do not look like this. So a coral that is white is either dead or it is very, very, very unhappy and very stressed. So one of the things we've been seeing around the world over the past 20 years that we don't like to see is this phenomenon of coral bleaching. So coral bleaching happens when water temperatures get too warm for the corals and they stay there for several months. So these are photos I took in the Indian Ocean in 2015 as a coral bleaching event was just beginning. So normally these corals should look brown, they should look yellow, um, so any of these colors, this kind of light yellow and this blue, this is a coral reef in serious trouble. It is seriously stressed out and not happy. So these are all just some photos. So these are all called uh, table corals. So these type of corals are among the most sensitive in the world to high temperature stress. And in this final picture in the middle here, what we see is a type of puffer fish. So this guy is called a guinea fowl puffer fish, and he actually eats coral. He is a coralivore. So the reason I included this picture is because all around him are these bleached corals. And one of the things we learned after our trip to the Indian Ocean, many of these reefs unfortunately died. So what that means is guys like this who need coral to survive probably also didn't make it. As I said, coral bleaching is a global problem. It's happened everywhere around the globe. Here's some pictures of coral bleaching that have taken place in Florida in 2014 and 2015. This is not how reefs are supposed to look. So to give you a little more of an explanation about coral bleaching, now a coral is actually an animal. It's related to things like sea anemones, jellyfish, so that animal actually lives in a symbiotic relationship. Make sure I'm doing okay on time. The animal lives in a symbiotic relationship with, with algae. So these algae live in its tissues and it provides them with food, oxygen, sunscreens, which are kind of crazy because corals are experiencing a lot of ultraviolet radiation. Well, these algae are like, hey, here's some sunscreen so you don't get a sunburn. It's really nice. In return, the corals provide the algae a home. They give them food via nutrients, and they also provide them carbon dioxide that they can use for photosynthesis. Now, for some reason, this symbiotic relationship is extremely sensitive to temperatures. If temperatures are just two to three degrees Fahrenheit above normal during the summer for a month or more, corals start bleaching, and that's because they lose their symbiotic algae and they turn white. So this coral is fully bleached. However, it's not dead yet, it's still alive. So if temperatures decline quickly, the coral can recover its algal symbionts and survive. However, if temperatures stay warm for too long, the coral will essentially starve to death because it runs out of food because the algae provide about 95% of the food for the coral. So when the corals lose their symbiotic algae, they are in trouble. They are in dire straits. And it's essentially like being in the intensive care unit in the hospital. They need help and they need it fast. So to illustrate to you why coral bleaching is so detrimental to a coral reef, I wanna show you an example from the Galapagos Islands. So these are pictures from a reef in the Galapagos Islands taken in 1976. So the Galapagos had smaller reefs, nothing really huge or big like you would see in the Great Barrier Reef, but they're still reefs. And these are old photos, so bear with me. These were taken by my PhD advisor, Peter Glenn. And this just shows you the reef in 1976. And all this white, it looks white, but that's actually all living coral. And the reason it looks white is because this is a very old photograph. In 1982 and 1983, there was a very strong El Nino event. And this caused seawater temperatures to stay about five degrees above normal for months. And as a result, 
nearly all the corals in the Galapagos Islands died. And once the corals died, the reef eroded away in about 10 years. So this is what the same reef looks like today. And well, this was 2012, it's already eight years ago, but as of 2017, it looked the same. So there has been no recovery. The corals on this reef died and they were completely eroded away. And one thing I want you to notice, there aren't very many fish on this reef. You don't see many other organisms. That's because all the organisms that live on a coral reef depend on the structure and the corals for their survival, and now they're gone. And corals are not the only animal on coral reefs that have symbiotic algae. Now, I told you I love to take photos of clownfish. Well, the anemones that clownfish depend on for their survival have symbiotic algae that are also sensitive to high temperatures. Here's an anemone in the Indian Ocean, bleaching because of the hot water. You'll see the tentacles have lost a lot of their pigmentation and the anemone itself is going from pink to white. And here's another uh, clownfish where his anemone has completely turned white. So those anemones, unless the waters cool off and they're able to recover their algae, will likely die. And what that means is if those, if those anemones die, these clownfish don't have a home anymore to protect them from predators, which means these clownfish will likely be eaten by bigger fish on the reef. So it's not all doom and gloom. I don't wanna make you guys too sad. We have discovered some corals that can actually resist and recover from bleaching events. So here we see a huge coral that recovered from bleaching. This entire reef in the Florida Keys actually recovered very, very well from very warm conditions in 2014 and 2015. So this is an endangered species of coral. It's called the mountainous star coral. Now in this image, this is about as tall as a person. So roughly say six feet tall. Now these corals grow about, I would say three feet every hundred years. So what you're looking at here is a coral that's at least 200 years old. And luckily, it was able to survive and recover from this bleaching event. So that's all I have for you today. I'm happy to take any questions. And I just wanted to share one more photo of you of a crazy puppy style sea lion in the Galapagos dive bombing me and saying, hey, what are you doing here? Um, and again, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today. And I hope that I've sparked your interest for coral reefs. And I hope that you will grow up and understand the beauty and the sensitivity and the fragility of these natural treasures that we have on our planet. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. We do have a lot of questions and we're already over time. So I'm just going to pick a couple, um, but Derek has offered to respond to some questions. I know Mrs. Mitchell's class, we didn't get to all your questions up there um, in Oregon, but um, Derek is gonna respond to those via email. Um, so a couple of questions on the topic you just covered, Derek. Um, Megan asked a really good question when you talked about the symbiotic algae. So we're concerned about corals, but should we be more worried about the conditions that um, allow for the algae? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, and there's been a lot of research that goes into trying to understand why um, the corals and the algae, why that symbiosis kind of breaks down. Um, and I think right now, the hypothesis is that bleaching is essentially a response to high temperatures and high light. So basically, corals need a lot of light because they, the algae photosynthesize and create food for the coral. But when it gets too hot, it's kind of like when you go out in the middle at noon in the middle of summer, you know, when that sun gets too, too searing on you, it causes trouble and it causes trouble for the algae. It actually makes the algae toxic to the corals. So the coral wants to get rid of it because the algae is under so much stress that it's basically rele releasing toxins and, and stressing out the coral. So the coral just wants nothing to do with it. So related to your question, there are different types of symbiotic algae and we've been able to find, well, the coral reef science community has been able to find over the past 20 to 25 years that there are certain algae that are much more tolerant to high temperatures than others. So there's been a lot of research 
to understand if we can use those temperature tolerant algae and maybe infect corals that are sensitive to bleaching. So there is a lot of research going on and it's a very, very complicated question. And I would say that there are a lot of scientists that focus solely on the algae and how to make them more tolerant to warmer conditions. Well, we definitely have enough for some questions after the webinar. So we're gonna maybe have to um, commandeer Derek to answer a few more. Uh, can we ask one final uh, question that I, that was also, um, when you talk about the higher temperatures, um, someone in Aaron in Camden, Maine asks, will the corals migrate to deeper waters to avoid the high temperatures and bleaching? That's a great question. So one of the things I just said is that because corals have these symbiotic algae is that they require a lot of light. So corals generally, once you get deeper than about 100 feet in the ocean, there really aren't very many corals, but there are locations that are called mesophotic reefs. And these are kind of what are called the twilight reefs. So the light doesn't get very right, but there are locations in the Virgin Islands <clears throat> where there are a ton of corals in like 100, 200 feet of water. So that lends support to the idea that corals already in deeper water might actually be more resistant to bleaching. Um, hmm. As of right now, I don't think we have much evidence that corals are, you know, jump into deeper water. I think right now what we're seeing is that some of the corals that already occur in deeper water are surviving better. Um, but the issue with deep water, again, is corals need light to grow. So there's really a limit into, into how deep you can actually get before there isn't just enough light. And the deeper you go too, it's actually colder. So you kind of have this, this thin window, you know, from about 100 feet to zero feet where corals just do really well because they get enough light and it's warm. And then once you get deeper, things start getting a little more stressful for them. Well, thank you so much, Derek, for um, sharing your beautiful photographs. You're, you're not just a coral reef scientist, you're clearly an artist as well. Um, and so for you kids out there who, are, who love to take photographs, maybe you should start thinking about being a diver, then you could take photographs underwater. Um, so we will get Derek, if you have any more questions, just put them in the box there or email them to us when you get your uh, follow-up survey for the webinar. And Derek, we thank you so much for your time. It's really cool to see what a day in the life of a coral reef scientist is like. I think you have a great job. Thank you. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. So we will uh, see you next week at the same time. And I hope that everybody has a great evening. And um, we'll see you next time on NOAA Live. <laughs>